Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Leaving the Farm, right here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. We are a listener-supported radio station, where if you'd like to donate, please visit us at www.freedomslips.com and click on our support pages. Every little bit helps. We're also simulcasting, as always, on No Borders Radio, at noborgersradio.co.uk, tammypepperman.org, Tuner Sewer, Scottish Sovereigns, of course, and uh, many, many, many others. If you would like to donate to keep us on net and on the air, please visit us at tammypepperman.org and click on the donate button just below the No Borders Radio player. Wow, heck of a week. Start out here. Bo and I have been reporting on this uh, U.S. District Judge Mark Fuller out of uh, Birmingham from the AL.com. Federal Judge Mark Fuller accepts plea deal in domestic violence case. Could have arrest record expunged. Fuller, who serves as an Alabama's Federal Middle District was arrested August 9th after his wife reported to police that her husband was drunk when he beat her while they were at an Atlanta hotel. She had accused him of having an extramarital affair with his law clerk. When Fuller appeared in at an Atlantic, Atlanta Magistrate Court hearing this morning, he accepted a plea deal for pre-trial diversion offered by the solicitor and Fuller's attorney, Barry Ragsdale. Plea deal was approved by the judge and with the consent of Fuller's wife, he said. Under the deal, Fuller has to have drug and alcohol evaluation, Ragsdale said. Fuller has already had one performed by a private counseling service, and Ragsdale said he hopes the judge will accept that report. If not, Fuller will undergo the, an evaluation by a counseling service approved by the court, he said. He doesn't have a drug or alcohol problem and never has. Ragsdale said Fuller also will have to undergo a once-a-week family and domestic violence program for 24 weeks. Ragsdale said the judge can undergo that counseling at a court-approved counseling service in Alabama. Once he completes those requirements, there will be no charges and his record will be expunged under the deal, Ragsdale said. Quote, it will essentially put him back with a clean record, he said. Ragsdale provided a statement from Fuller following the hearing, quote, I reached this difficult decision after consulting with my family and deciding that it was everyone's best interest to put this incident behind us, and quote, Fuller stated, quote, while I regret that my decision means that the full and complete facts regarding this incident will likely not come out, I have no doubt that it is what is best for all involved, end quote. Quote, this incident has been very embarrassing to me, my family, friends, and the court. I deeply regret this incident. Look forward to working to resolve these difficulties with my family, where they should be resolved, Fuller stated. As difficult as this situation is, I hope that you can respect the need to let my family heal as we move forward with addressing our private and personal family issues. I look forward to completing the family counseling that I voluntarily began several weeks ago and to successfully completing the requirements of the diversion. I also look forward to addressing the concerns of the court, hopefully returning to full active status in Middle District of Alabama. It's interesting, those uh, cognitive judgments surprises that can occur after a plea deal is met. From THV11.com update, doctor charged with three more voyeurism counts. Paragold, Arkansas. Authorities say a Paragold gynecologist accused of taking nude photographs of patients faces additional charges after three more patients came forward and said he took pictures of them. Green County District Judge found probable cause Tuesday to charge Paul Becton with three more counts of felony video voyeurism. Becton is already charged with five counts and is pleaded not guilty. Becton was arrested in April after authorities say a female patient told Paragold police that he used his cell phone to take pictures of her during an exam. 
Arkansas State Police investigators said they found many images of nude women on Becton's cell phone. He was released from jail after posting bond. A message left with Becton's attorney wasn't immediately returned Wednesday. Weston doctor charged with domestic battery from NBCMiami.com. A Broward County doctor was arrested over the weekend and is now facing domestic battery charges, according to officials. Dr. Raphael Azule from Weston appeared before a judge Monday on allegations that he strangled and battered a female victim. While state prosecutors argued that officers saw injuries on the victim's neck that would be consistent with strangulation, the judge found no probable cause to battery by strangulation charges for or felony battery charges in the arrest report, which is contradictory to the evidence, meaning that that is not a judge, that is an administrator, an attorney in a black dress, and he shall be held accountable for this too. The judge reduced Asley's bond from the state's recommendation of 10000 per charge to 6000 in total FRNs and reduced the felony battery charges to misdemeanor battery charges. Looks like this judge and the doctor have maybe some investments together and he's trying to cover his own butt. The judge also ordered Azulay have no contact with the victim. The judge gave prosecutors 48 hours to have police add more detail to their arrest report before reevaluating the charges. According to the report, the mother of the alleged victims told deputies her daughter was, quote, in trouble and was being held against her will by her live-in boyfriend, Asley. Deputies arrived, went to Asley's house. They found the girlfriend with a laceration under her eye and bruising on her back neck, arms, and legs, the report said. The woman was visibly afraid and crying and said she wanted to get her belongings out of the house, the report said. Authorities later confirmed that the woman was kept at the house under duress between August 28th and August 34, 31st, the report said. She was also to have found, found to have had, suffered an orbital fracture to the left side of her face. Asley wouldn't let the woman use her phone or leave to seek medical attention after he physically attacked her and instead reportedly gave the woman Percocet to subdue the pain she had suffered. Asley has been practicing medicine for 14 years, according to the Florida Board of Medicine. His online biography states he's trained at the University of Miami and sees patients at Memorial Hospital Pembroke and Memorial Hospital West in Myanmar, among others. It is unknown if Azale will hire a private attorney. Interesting turn. These doctors and judges working in tandem to human traffic human beings. and They don't like rolling on each other, do they? From the register, Herald.com, Lewisburg doctor charged after allegedly threatening his family with a gun. Lewisburg doctor was jailed after allegedly threatening his family with a gun. Dr. Joe O. Othman, 64, of Lewisburg, is charged with two counts of wanton endangerment involving a firearm, two counts of domestic assault, according to a criminal complaint from Greenbrier County Magistrate Court. Police were sent to Othman's home in Lewisburg Saturday in response to reports of an intoxicated man with a gun. While on their way to the scene, police were told that Othman's mother-in-law and special needs daughter were still in the house. Officers found Salnab Shama Othman, Dr. Othman's wife, standing in the driveway and visibly shaken. She kept yelling, quote, he has a gun, end quote. Officers went into the house and found Othman sitting in a deep chair, blaring Arabic music. Othman was staring straight ahead. Othman was ordered to put his hands up. Othman didn't listen at first and suddenly stood up and rushed at the officers, according to the complaint. Two police officers grabbed Othman's arms and forced him to the ground. Once he was on the ground, officers handcuffed him, the, complete, the complaint said. The search of the area turned up a Glock 45 caliber pistol. It had 11 rounds in it and one in the chamber. 
Once Hoffman was in police in a police cruiser. Uh, sorry about that, folks. It's got a different page. Now, scripting is all messed up. If you want to read more, please visit the registerherald.com. This for doctor charged. There's a, a rampant uh, upswing in what's going on, and today, one of the most interesting news items of interest actually comes out of the SPLcenter.org, which, of course, everybody knows how much I love the attorneys at the Southern Poverty Law Center, having been promoting civil war for ever since their inception. Looks like somebody has been forsaken. From SPLcenter.org, Michael Hathman, longtime fair attorney charged with child sex abuse. Michael Hathman, a senior counsel for the legal arm of the anti immigrant hate group Federation for American Immigration Reform, or FAIR, has been charged with child sexual abuse. Hathman is also running for a Maryland delegate seat that would represent a part of Prince George County, Maryland. According to WUSA 9, court records show that the mother of the girl who reported the abuse is a nurse practitioner helping Hefman care for his elderly father. Investigators claim Hefman was with the 8-year-old outside a barn on his property when he offered to brush hay off of her. The child alleged Hefman put his hands inside her pants and charged her sexually. Hefman then attempted to put the victim's hand inside his pants, court records say. He's currently free on bail. Hefman has been instrumental to FAIR's legal arm, Immigration Reform Law Institute, and its efforts to pass harsh anti-immigrant legislation in various states and localities. Hefman has cynically said in the past that he didn't care if these laws turned out to be unconstitutional or if fighting for them in the courts were to be financially disastrous for states and localities, which they have been. Quote, sink or swim, these new laws are forcing Congress to confront the need for enforcement-based reform. He wrote in a 2000 op-ed for CNN. More important is that they provoked sustainable integration reform. At another time, Ethman called the laws, quote, field tests, of course they are, experiments aimed at testing the legality of various approaches to immigration. Ethman did not respond to requests for comment. On a side note, this is what it says in the book, Psychiatrists, the men behind Hitler, Chapter 5, Useless Bread Gobblers. All it takes is an attorney convincing you that it's truth and it's right, and they can convince you to dehumanize each other by which genocide can occur. It's nice to see one of the pedophiles actually listed on SPLC rather than an innocent victim being terrorized by that same terrorist cell. From the JDJournal.com, Illinois attorney suspended pr practice of law after pr prostitution charges filed. Rima Baha, an Illinois attorney who was charged with prostitution in 2011, has been suspended from the practice of law for misconduct related to the charges. June 2011, JD Journal reported that an Illinois attorney, Rima Baja, was charged with three counts of prostitution. Charges were prostitution within a thousand feet of a school and two counts of prostitution. First count carried up to three years in prison, and the other two counts carried less than a year in county jail. Apparently, the incidents occurred on August 13, 2010, and another occurred that May. Baha admitted she had participated in prostitution before receiving her law license, but she stopped after she became an attorney. ABA Journal reported that Baha worked as a call girl for six years during law school. She apparently used the income to open her own law practice as well. Sun Times reported that Baha pled guilty to the misdemeanor prostitution charge. She agreed to two years of court supervision. 
$2,500 fine, 50 hours of community service, and a psychological evaluation in exchange for the state's dismissal of the felony charge and the remaining misdemeanor. According to the ABA Journal, Baja has now been suspended from the practice of law for three years. A 28-year-old attorney had created a profile using the alias Nikita on adultfriendfinder.com. Two men answered the ads, and Baja performed sex acts with them. The attorney denied receiving money for the acts. Of course not. This is how they facilitate human and massive. Everybody knows what Adult Friend Finder is. Of course, it was made famous for me when uh, Rocco found himself an agent on Adult Friend Finder that worked for the state that completely redistributed his estate at the behest of her husband, which, of course, is the state of Wisconsin, the state of Illinois. And to all of our listeners, of course being aware of this situation. It's all been very interesting. I think the lesson learned would be perhaps, perhaps, perhaps you shouldn't kidnap people in exchange for ransom in the United States so we don't negotiate with terrorists. From SLT sltoday.com St. Louis attorney arrested on charges of hindering prosecution St. Louis criminal defense attorney is jailed in St. Francis County and accused of interfering with a felony case San Francois County sorry prosecuted prosecuting attorney Gerald Marin charged Brian Christopher Edwards 44 with the class D felony of hindering prosecution Bail was set at $25,000 in far ends, and he was ordered to surrender his passport. According to court records, <coughs> excuse me, Edwards represented Jessica Weaver in two criminal cases, one a federal case and the other two felony counts of distribution of a controlled substance in St. Francois County. Charge against Edwards of the 3900 block of Pot Potomac Street alleged he had an intimate relationship with Weaver while she was incarcerated in the county jail. She was released from jail on July 21st and remanded to the custody of a treatment facility in St. Louis as a condition of her federal probation. Weaver arrived there at the end of July and left on August 1st. Probation violation warrant for her arrest was issued August 14th, alleging Weaver had fled the area, quote, in fear of being turned over to police, end quote. Charge against Edward alleged that he had maintained contact with Weaver even though he was aware she absconded from probation and has a felony warrant. It alleged he talked to her by phone to her shopping. Of course, this is what attorneys do. Uh, the whole plan is to violate the subject involved by which to facilitate the generation of revenue which is, of course, the function of the Internal Revenue Service. The lover and uh, partner of all of these attorneys tricking human beings out. From articles.sunsentinel.com, Judge Pollack pleads guilty to DUI charge. I've always been covering this one since uh, for quite a while now. And apparently, uh, Giselle Pollock has uh, pled guilty. County Judge Giselle Pollock defied the advice of her lawyers Thursday and pleaded guilty in a Broward courtroom to one count of driving under the influence of alcohol, landing a probation sentence. Pollock's lawyers, Michael Catalano and Eric Schwartzreich, that's funny, had announced that the judge would be pleading no contest to resolve the case that stemmed from her May 2nd arrest following a car accident in Plantation. A no contest plea would have given Pollock some legal flexibility in an expected civil case brought by the driver who was injured by Pollock. 
With all due respect to Mr. Swartrike and Mr. Catalano, I'm going to plead guilty because I am guilty, Pollock said to Miami-Dade County Judge Andrea Wolfson. Quote, I am guilty of letting myself down, and I'm guilty of letting my community down. I'm not here to make excuses, end quote. Pollock, who has battled alcoholism throughout her adult life, said she had not had a drink for 19 years before last December when she took the bench in misdemeanor drug court while noticeably drunk, despite promising the Judicial Qualifications Commission that it wouldn't happen again. Pollock took the bench while drunk a second time in March. She blamed her relapse on personal pressure. Last fall, her mother passed away and her 24-year-old son was permanently disabled following complications from a hernia surgery. We all know this because we watched Joan Rivers just go through the same accidental uh, display and presentation as her family was terrorized. And we watched as Casey Kasem was murdered by a court process the same way. And we watched as Joseph Reynolds was a victim of genocide as well. Sonia Marie, and all of these different uh, victims of what is actually defined as fourth generation warfare. And this judge seems like she's in the position of what used to be only how a citizen was treated under Roman rule. However, that looks to be changed. She continues on, quote, I am sober, she said, I am healthy, and I am committed to never, ever drink again. Pollock was sentenced to six months of probation. In addition, she will pay a $500 fine, perform 75 hours of community service, will have to wear an electronic monitor that will send an email notification to the probation office if she consumes any alcohol. In pleading guilty, Pollock also has apologize to Di Dylan Brazic, the injured driver. It was never clear how intoxicated Pollock was the night of the crash. Catalano said she asked for a blood test after her arrest, then refused to comply, then asked for one again. She also agreed to take a breath test, but it was never done. The courtroom on Wednesday was packed with supporters of the judge, including numerous defense lawyers, drug court graduates, and three elected officials, State Rep. Perry Thurston, County Clerk of Courts Howard Foreman, and County Property Appraiser Lori Parrish. Is that an interesting audience in a courtroom? Well, if you've ever noticed the audience when you're in their courts of law, the, appraise, the appraisal on the property has usually already been done because the judge there is looking at your title report, what your debt is, how much you can offset from congressional discharge, uh, discharging congressional bankruptcy under 28 U.S.C. subsection 453, the judicial oath. And maintains that they're swearing an oath to discharge congressional bankruptcy. Of course, it's the way the business goes. Belfast from the Belfast Telegraph. Co. Uk doctor charges sex assaults on six female patients. Doctor Tony Chi, 45, from Warringfield, closed in. Pragvon faced seven charges of sexual assault against six women. They are alleged to have happened at Rich Hill Health Center in County Armagh between 2009 and 2011, when the practice severed its ties with him. The GP showed no emotion as a string of charges were read out during his first appearance at Armagh Magistrates Court. He spoke only to confirm his name and date of birth and nodded to indicate that he understood all of the allegations. Releasing Dr. G on bail of £1,000, District Judge Paul Copeland ordered him to adhere to strict bail conditions, which included a ban on unsupervised contact with female patients. 
Other bail conditions imposed prevent Dr. Chi from contacting any of the complainants, and he must live in an address approved by the court. The court also heard that the police investigation was still ongoing and that the doctor had already surrendered his passport to police. Dressed in a dark suit, white shirt, and striped tie, Dr. Chi was accompanied in the public gallery by a woman believed to be his wife. He is due to appear at Arma Magistrate's Court again on October 14th. From the MansfieldNewsJournal.com, defense attorney charged with 10 counts. Ashland, John Good never suspected he would have to turn in his former law partner. Good, now the Ashland Municipal Court judge, called police last week when he discovered nearly $9,000 FRNs missing from a former client's trust account. Tim Potts, an Ashland defense attorney and a former member of the Ashland County Prosecutor's Office, has been charged in the case. Potts, 43, pleaded not guilty Tuesday to charges of grand theft, two counts, obstructing justice, forgery, passing bad checks, falsification, endangering children, possession of cocaine, possession of heroin, and possession of drug paraphernalia. Potts and Good both worked under former prosecutor Robert DeSanto, then formed a legal partnership until Good became municipal court judge in 2012. I was shocked. Good. <laughs> I was shocked, Good said. Quote, I would not imagine that Tim Potts would do something like this. I never had any reason to believe Tim Potts was involved in drugs or that he would steal. End quote. I feel bad for this family, but I don't feel bad for him at all. <laughs> Oh my goodness, they're just such a innocent Judas. Every one of them so innocent. Man, I can't believe this is happening. He's, there's no such thing as a good attorney. Come on, people, this is funny. There's a new Judas in town. This judge never imagined his partner in law was such a corrupt, a corrupt individual. The irony of so many things. It's like that uh, quote from Jesus on the cross, Matthew 27. Father, why have you forsaken me? From LATimes.com, Deputy LA City Attorney arrested on multiple child porn charges. Deputy Los Angeles City Attorney has been arrested and charged with possession of child pornography, authorities said Friday. Christopher Richard Garcia, 57, was arrested Thursday afternoon at his home in San Pedro and booked on suspicion of possessing and distributing child pornography, said Officer Liliana Preciado, a spokesman for the Los Angeles Police Department. Garcia had been under investigation since at least November when authorities served a search warrant at his home and seized computers and other electronic evidence, Preciado said. At the time, they found some questionable images. A forensic search of the computer revealed evidence of child exploitation, she said. Prosecutors said Garcia has been charged with sending or bringing obscene material into the state for sale and possession of material depicting minors engaged in sexual conduct. He allegedly sent some of the material on April 2, 2013, and was found in possession of it that November, according to court records. An arrest warrant was issued Thursday, and jail records show he has since posted $40,000 bail for FRNs. The California State Bar website lists Garcia as serving as an attorney for Los Angeles International Airport. Garcia previously worked with the U.S. Attorney's Office and a Joint Electronic Crimes Task Force. City Attorney Spokesman Rob Wilcox said in a statement Friday that they were aware of Garcia's arrest, quote, When our office became aware of these allegations ten months ago, Mr. Garcia was immediately, immediately placed on administrative leave where he remains today. Wilcox said, quote, We cannot comment for, further on the ongoing 
criminal matter. Interesting days. Of course, just had no idea of this corruption. <coughs> Excuse me. From smartcompany.com.au, Queensland real estate attorney, a real estate agent on alleged drug ring charges. A Queensland real estate agent faced court on Tuesday on drug related charges after police busted in at an alleged Redlands methamphetamine ring. LJ Hooker agent Brian. Patrick McCann of Cleveland was one of five men charged after police raided six properties on Monday. McCann, 36, faces 34 drug-related charges. Last year, he sold more than $40 million FRN of property, but his LJH webpage quickly came down overnight. McCann was detained for questioning on Monday in relation to allegedly trafficking dangerous drugs supplying and possession, according to the Redland City Bulletin. The Queensland paper reported the estate agent who appeared in the dock wearing a Scooby-Doo t-shirt in court repeatedly interrupted proceedings, denying he was an addict and was told to sit down and be quiet when he tried to interject. Defense lawyer David Spiro said McCann was a successful real estate agent who made $100,000 FRN in commission last month. He also told the court his client was a drug addict who had received commercial recompense from drugs twice when he had the same carpentry work done in return for drugs. Wow, what a good defense attorney rolling on his client like that publicly. That's interesting. Oh. Spears said the alleged large-scale drug trafficking was, quote, Fanciful. There's only one allegation from the affidavit that my client received commercial recompense for an alleged supply, and that's the person who provided carpentry service, he said. Quote, this idea that my client is running a large-scale operation in supply in my submission is fanciful, end quote. McCann's father, Patrick, a retired real estate agent who watched proceedings, said he was devastated and his son had worked hard to achieve and it must be a typo in the real estate industry. McCann was remanded in custody until 27 October when he's due to reappear in Wyoming Magistrate's Court for a committal mention. Interesting days. What's that for a guilty plea without your knowledge? Apparently. From the IndyStar.com, IMPD officer charged with lying about sex. An Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department officer lied by saying he never had sex with a woman, but later accused him of rape, according to an Indiana State Police detective. IMPD officer Andrew Tyler, 29, later confessed to lying to investigators, according to court documents, and admitting to having sex with a woman. Tyler was arrested Thursday by state police on a misdemeanor charge of false informing. Sexual encounter occurred at Tyler's home on August 31, 2013, according to court documents. On September 4, 2013, the woman involved in the encounter told staff at the St. Elizabeth Hospital in Lafayette that Tyler had raped her, police said. When a state police detective interviewed Tyler on September 19, 2013, Tyler said the woman stayed a night at his home after the two connected via a dating website. Perhaps adult friend finder. He told police he was not interested in pursuing a relationship with a woman, but allowed her to stay at his home because it grew late. Tyler admitted to being quote, cuddled up with the woman on a couch and kissing her, according to court documents, but he said he intended the intimacy to com comfort the woman and not as a prelude to sex, according to court documents. Tyler allowed the woman to spend the night in his master bedroom, he told detective, while he slept in a spare one. 
On July 17, 2014, the state police detective confronted Tyler with DNA evidence taken from the woman's body that matched Tyler's. Isn't that interesting that five days had passed between the encounter and when she reported this to the hospital staff? I wonder where they found that evidence. It's interesting. If anybody wants to read more of this, it's on my Indie Star. It looks like another fog eye because it's uh, quite a posture there. In the Washington Post. It's interesting to see what's going on in Venezuela. Everybody's being shaken down. Corruption is being alleged all over. And then all of a sudden, from the Washington Post.com, shadowy cell of Venezuela paper raises fear of slow building news blackout. Caracas, Venezuela, through, the, through 15 years of rolling social change, the Venezuelan newspaper El Universal has been a go-to source for readers looking for tough coverage and criticism of the political upheavals brought by Hugo Chavez, the late president. So when reporters and evidence editors came to work one day in July and learned that the paper had been sold by the family that had owned it for 105 years, they were anxious to know why. If there were no farewell speeches, no tearful goodbyes, and certainly no chance to meet the new owners, Nothing like that, said Juan Francisco Alonso, a reporter and union delegate. Quote, it was total opacity. Then, anonymity of the new ownership group and a dearth of information about the sale as many Venezuelans fearing it is the latest major media company to fall to what they view as insidious new way for the oil-rich government to neuter its critics. After squeezing them into economic distress, it buys them out with a little help from its friends. Marian Gracia Chirinos, a researcher with Caracas Media Watchdog Group, IPYS, said the pattern began to emerge last year after the sale of the television network Global Vision, which is popular with Venezuela's opposition. Under new ownership, the network purged its new roots room and stopped airing live speeches by opposition leader Hen Henry Capriles, who narrowly lost to Chavez's successor, Nicolas Maduro, in last April's presidential race. After Global Vision flipped, the same thing happened with another major news company and its popular daily paper, Ultimus no Noticias. In both cases, media companies that were critical of the government were sold to unknown investors, and that was followed by an editorial shift. Chirino said. Commenters and colum columnists were dumped, investigative reporting teams were disbanded, headlines got sunnier, even as news about Venezuela's economy and crime problems only got worse. Critics see the heads of government allies pulling these strings with money earned through business ties to top officials. It's by no means clear yet that this will be true for Al Universal under its new ownership group. Apolisticia, a mysterious holding company registered in Spain last year with less than 6,000 foreign dollars in declared assets on a website still under construction. One of the biggest questions in the newsroom is why the company would want to buy all the Universal at a time when Venezuela is facing acute shortages of paper products, including newsprint. Jose Luis Basanta, a spokesman for the company, said the paper was acquired for less than $22 million FRNs, telling Bloomberg its owners were willing to ride out the country's current troubles with the expectation that the paper would make money again if political changes in Venezuela lead to more favorable business climate. Quote, they are convinced this is going to happen, said Basanta, describing the new owners as a group of wealthy international associates with as much as $1 billion to invest in media, energy, and real estate, a universal was their first purchase. Following this sale, the Polystesia installed a new president at the paper, Jesus Abru Enselmi. He assured the staff that the paper's editorial commitment to impartiality would not change. The new owners had no connect connection to the Maduro government. But the lack of transparency has been hardly reassuring for Al Universal's 800 or so employees, including its newsroom staff of 120. 
Apprehensions about the new owner's intentions boiled over last month when the reporters and editors issued a collective statement denouncing the censorship of an article about protesting steelworkers at the Cedar plant in Ciudad Guyana and their contract dispute with the government. The statement said the correspondent's story had been rewritten to convey only the Maduro's administration version of events, giving readers the mistaken impression that the workers had reconciled with the government. Quote, we want to convey to the whole country, and especially the readers that have put their trust in us for decades, that we were worried about the changes in the editorial line since the sale, the statement read. Since the sale, nearly 30 editorial contributors have been told their columns won't be continued. Another 15 resigned in protest, according to Alonzo. A quick survey of El Universal's recent coverage doesn't indicate a dramatic change in content or tone, but there does appear to be a greater emphasis on sports and celebrity culture, and noticeably less skepticism about new government announcements, announcements and initiatives. During his 14 years in power, Chavez clashed frequent, frequently with Venezuela's private media companies, and he sent a chill through the country's new rooms when he revoked the broadcast license of the leading network RCTV in 2007. Chavez also tolerated a broader degree of criticism in Venezuela's media landscape. It was far more diverse during the early phases of his presidency. From the HuffingtonPost.com, top party schools vow to combat binge drinking, then sell branded shot glasses. Sierra Cruz University, like the University of Iowa before it, is vowing to combat student binge drinking after being named the Princeton's Review Top Party School in the nation. One step Sierra Cruz has already taken is to complain to nearby property managers about Castle Court, an apartment parking lot where students traditionally gather to drink. Earlier this summer, the complaints led the private company to ban parties in Castle Court, much to the chagrin of students. But while they've lost a hangout spot, Q's undergraduates can still have their branded beer pong tables and ping pong balls, and they can pound double shots from glasses branded with Sierra Cruz Auto the Orange, a result of the university making a trademark agreement with the companies that manufacture those glasses. Meanwhile, Iowa may have slipped to the number two party school this year, but it's still one of nearly two dozen universities taking heat from vocative writer Adam K. Raymond for licensing its images to jello for small molds about the size of jello shots. Let's be clear, students are definitely using the molds for jello shots. In short, both Sierra Cruz and Iowa are pushing the message that they're cracking down on out of control partying while also collecting money off of drinking paraphernalia branded with their school names. Don't forget the medical industry, folks. 1802 Indemnification Convention. These colleges are the core of the genocide schematic. And you are the laughing stock, no matter what your title is. WNDU.com ex cop charged with abusing kids while on duty. Flint, Michigan, a retired Flint police sergeant, has been charged with sexually assaulting children when he was on duty in the late 1990s. Authorities say some acts occurred at the police department and in police vehicles. Lawrence Woods appeared in court Friday and was returned to jail without bond. Defense attorney Frank Manley tells the Flint Journal the allegations are, quote, very serious. Flint Sergeant Carl Patrick says child pornography was seized Thursday at homes where Woods has stayed. He faces at least 25 years in prison if convicted of first-degree criminal sexual conduct. A hearing to determine if there's probable cause to send the 66-year-old Woods trial is set for October 2nd. Watch that one, folks. Very interesting days. As these uh, criminal elements were rounded up in droves. Sick. Sick, sick, sick. Uh, 
And hopefully in the second hour, um, over some more stuff. And, uh, we have to speed here. Sorry, I'm so slow. From Fox43.com, insurance agent charges stealing $20,000 FRNs from elderly couple. A Lancaster County insurance agent is charged with bilking a Manor Township couple out of $20,000 FRNs. Township Police say Paul J. Ciro, 62, of Danville, advised and encouraged the couple to give him the money which he, quote, invested, end quote, into a company that he was part of based out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Ciro promised the couple that they would reap monthly profits from this investment. The couple never received monthly profits or any compensation from the so-called investment. And the couple questioned Ciro. He kept them at bay by telling them that the money was tied up overseas and referred to refused to return their money. Ciro has been charged with theft by deception. Police say Ciro is licensed to sell insurance in Pennsylvania but not licensed to sell securities and or advise on investments. Ciro has recently charged with two other counts of theft by deception by New Holland Police for similar incidents involving elderly citizens that occurred in the Bureau in 2009 and 2010. In the Manor Township couple learned of their arrest. They contacted Manor Township Police to report they too were victims of zero. Sad. It's so sick when a society is full of uh, psychopathy willing to prey on not only the elderly, but women and children as well. One out of Idaho today, uh, we haven't seen much coming out of Idaho. I don't know if it's because it's a small area. When I was living north of Spokane, Washington, I noticed that uh, a lot of trade agreements are with Spokane and Lane in the surrounding area. From KMVT.com, Middleton City Councilman arrested on sexual battery charges. Caldwell, Idaho, a Southwest Idaho City Councilman is facing a charge of sexual battery of a minor 16 to 17 years old. Police arrested Middleton City Councilman Bradley Spencer Thursday and he was booked into the Canyon County Jail at about 10 p.m. Idaho State Police says Spencer was arrested at his work. Troopers are also investigating the possibility that there may be additional victims. Anyone with information in is asked to call 846-7550. Remember, this is an Idaho. It's not clear if Spencer has an attorney. According to Spencer's online bio on Middleton's website, Spencer owns Spencer's Music in Middleton. The City of Middleton released a statement Friday morning, quote, The City understands that Councilmember Brad Spencer was arrested on Thursday on the grounds of battery to a minor. We do not know any of these facts, and there are always two sides to every story. Individuals are innocent until proven guilty, and the City trusts the County and County Sheriff's and the Prosecuting Attorney's Office will conduct this investigation the same as it does any other. Yeah, me too. Now that the onslaught has stopped occurring against humanity, anyway. The court system will run its course, and then the outcome will be known. Until then, this incident does not affect Councilman Spencer's ability to participate in City Council and perform his duties under state law. Councilman Spencer has been active on the City Council, and his services benefited tremendously the residents of the city, end quote. From azfamily.com, corrections officer charged in fatal shooting of mother, Florence, Arizona. Corrections officer turned himself in to Florence police Thursday morning, saying he had shot someone. A sergeant saw a person who appeared suspicious walking through the Florence police department's back parking lot at approximately 10 a.m., according to a police spokesman, spokeswoman. When the sergeant went out to talk to the man, he reportedly said, quote, I need help. You need to arrest me, end quote. 
Upon further questioning, the man stated, quote, I just shot someone, end quote. The suspect was identified as Alexander A. Santiago, 41 of Florence. He is a correction officer with the Arizona Department of Corrections. Santiago faces charges of first-degree murder, second-degree murder, and aggravated assault with special circumstances. He is being held without bond. Officers responded to a home near 8th Street and Highway 79 and found a dead woman in the kitchen. Police said she had a single gunshot wound to the head. The victim had been identified as Santiago's mother, Sean M. Lafitte, 61. Police said they shared the home. An autopsy is scheduled for Monday. A motive for... A motive for the homicide has not been determined. Police are still investigating whether a weapon issued by the Department of Corrections was used in the shooting. Quote, there are numerous weapons inside the residence, so we're going to have to determine which weapon was actually used or if it's still in the residence. And quote, said Florence Police Chief Dan Hughes. Hughes said Santiago may have done some cleanup at the scene. Quote, it appears that he put napkins beneath her head and also had folded her arms. Mm. Creepy psychopaths. Creepy, creepy, creepy. Oh, we can put in a couple more here. Uh, interesting days as these FBI agents are rounded up. WLKY.com, Allen PD officer charged with mi official misconduct after using excessive force. Louisville, Kentucky, a Louisville Metro Police Department officer was stripped of her police duties and charged with official misconduct. Jennifer Knopp, a five-year veteran of the force, is also charged with harassment after an investigation revealed she would used excessive force during an arrest. Charges were filed early Friday morning, but the alleged incident happened June 6 when Knopf responded to a call of a shoplifter. Police say Knopf, who had no prior disciplinary record, used excessive force when making an arrest outside the Kmart on Popular Level Road. Poplar Level Road. Police say the woman who's Store clerks caught shoplifting. 30-year-old Amber Clay was alleged already out seated outside and handcuffed when, according to court documents, what's being called a verbal exchange began. Clay, who said Knopf was wearing a, swearing and called her a derogatory name, later filed a complaint. A three-month-long investigation followed, leading to Knopf being suspended from her police duties. Police say it said they are unsure of the woman's relationship, but appears that the two did know each other. There were several witnesses, and a video was caught on Knopf's dashboard camera. The video, which is not being released, captures the officer placing her foot on Clay's chest and kicking her with enough force that she fell over. Quote, unfortunately, we have officers who commit rule violations. We also have officers, unfortunately, that break the law, and when they break the law, we're going to follow up on that, pursue that accordingly, said LMPD spokesman Phil Russell. Mop has been taken off her patrol, and for now, she's working administrative duties. From AGC.com, Atlanta police issue arrest warrant for former APD detective. Atlanta police have issued an arrest warrant for a former APD investigator who resigned from the force last month. Resigned from the force last month. Channel 2 Action News reported that Atlanta police obtained a search warrant for Christopher Kitchell's apartment after the former APD, T, APD detective was arrested in DeKalb County for impersonating a police officer. Kitchell, 34, resigned from the APD on August 19th while under investigation by the department's Office of Professional Standards. He was arrested for allegedly showing an Atlanta police badge while being questioned by DeKalb officers during an incident at a bar, Channel 2 reported. When Atlanta officers searched Kitchell's Lindbergh Drive apartment after that arrest for any other department property that he had, been, he had not returned, Officers found cocaine, marijuana, anabolic steroids, and a rifle, according to Channel 2. 
Kitchen was the second current or recently resigned Atlanta police officer arrested last week. On Thursday, police arrested Tareem Zeus-Rana on charges that he killed a woman and set her body on fire in Hapeville. Rana was arrested at Hartsville-Jackson International Airport, where police said he was attempting to board a flight to Mexico. Interesting happenings in Atlanta, Georgia. I had a brother there once working with us to stop child sex trafficking. George Zinkon, of course, worked for the University of Georgia, and he was teaching compulsive behavior. My, how the tables have turned. Very interesting to see these things occurring moment by moment, day after day, as we have all suffered greatly at the hands of these psychopathic officials color of law by which to perpetrate genocide and all manner of harm upon human beings. It's nice to see that finally taking a, a breather and we'll be right back folks. Stick around. And welcome back to the second hour of Leaving the Farm right here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com where information never sleeps. We are a listener-supported radio station. Where, if you'd like to donate, please visit us at www.freedomslips.com and click on our support pages. Every little bit helps. We're also, simulcasting tonight, of course, is always on Borders Radio at nobordersradio.co.uk, tammypeppermint.org, and Sur, and SSOTL, of course. This is Gary. I haven't talked to Gary in a long time, and I'm praying he's well. From articles.sunsentinel.com Three cops charged with stealing from police union. Three Coral Springs police officers, including a detective assigned to embezzlement cases, were charged Thursday with stealing thousands of dollars from their own police union. One officer, Doug Williams, turned himself in at the Broward, Maine jail early Thursday on charges of pilfering more than $1,500 FRNs and spending it at the supermarket, a home improvement store, and several restaurants. The other, his wife, Sherry Williams, and economic crimes detectives, Michael Hughes, an undercover detective, were charged with multiple counts of grand theft and an organized scheme to defraud. Well, they're expected to surrender in the next day or so, said their attorney Michael Dutko, Dovko. No, Dutko. Doug Williams, 56, former president of the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 37, was charged with grand theft. He joined Coral Springs in 1981 as an investigator. Tired. Um... Retired in September 2009 to collect a $4,999.02 a month pension and was rehired immediately as a part time officer. He's been suspended from the agency since October's records show. According to an arrest report, in September 2009, Williams used the union's Wells Fargo debit card to make $1,584.80 in purchases, including items from Publix, Sears, and Lowe's. He's also accused of spending the money at several restaurants, including Chili's, Fogarty's, and Brew Room Sports Grill, and making a $300 cash withdrawal. Glenn Matina, current FOP president, said Williams was president from 2002 to 2008, and was vice president when the alleged incidents happened. His card was strictly for union business and approved purchases. Quote, we're very disappointed in his actions, end quote. Matinex said the investigation was sparked by a random audit by the IRS in 2012, which questions improper transactions. As a result, the 200-member FOP hired an accountant for forensic analysis, said union attorney Alan Diamond. The review found excessive amounts of cash withdrawals and charges lacking receipts or invoices from January 2006 
to December 2011. Well, that's when they realized the discrepancies weren't tax issues as much as they were legal issues, end quote. Past Union President Hughes is accused of spending $16,000 at far end of Union money on groceries, restaurants, and cash withdrawals, according to Union officials. Hughes, 42, served as Union Vice President in 2006 and 2007 and President for four years beginning in 2008. He began his career with the Coral Springs Police Department in 2001 and earned $80,358, city officials said. Sherry Williams was Union Treasurer from 98 to 2011. She is accused of making cash withdrawals and purchases of over $30,000, union officials said. Among her improper expenses, $400 office chair shipped to her father's house, union officials said. Her personal file includes praise for work as an economic crimes detective. One of the Sherry's notable cases involved an employee who embezzled over $300,000 from her employer during a three-year period, a job evaluation read. Sherry was able to charge the subject and proved a theft amount of $148,000. She had her share of discipline, too. In 2003, she was reprimanded for missing a court appearance where she was to testify as the arresting officer. Charges against the defendant were dismissed, according to her file. In 2011, she was punished for taking her assigned car to Punta Gorda for a family emergency without permission. Well, that's sad to, to, to uh, see that. Isn't that what they're for? Former police chief Duncan Foster wrote that driving 440 miles while off duty was irresponsible. He suspended for her for 160 hours and ordered her to reimburse the city $224.40 for wear on the car. Sherry Williams, 48, joined the department in 94 as a service aide and was promoted to officer the following year. She was earning $86,537 FRNs annually, officials said. He was just put on administrative leave with pay Wednesday, police said. The Williamses resigned Thursday. Dotco, whose firm represents all three officers, said Doug Williams was released on, from jail on a $1,000 bond. He maintains his innocence, Dotco said. said Matanak, to discover that our leaders were stealing money from us is such a huge betrayal of trust. Get on in there, surely. That was interesting to see The Hill this week, thehill.com. Fidel Castro accuses McCain and Israel of creating ISIS. We must remember how Cuba got its start by, of course, being attacked by Congress and the Civil War promoted there and then entering into peace treaties from Avalon.law.yale.edu 20th Century DIP Cuba 002 Agreement between the United States and Cuba for the lease of lands for coaling and naval stations February 23rd 1903, signed by the President of Cuba, February 16th, 1903, signed by the President of the United States, February 23rd, 1903. Between the United States of America and the Republic of Cuba for the lease, subject to terms to be agreed on by the two governments, to the United States of Land and Cuba for calling and naval stations, United States of America and the Republic of Cuba being desirous to execute fully the provisions of Article 7 of the Act of Congress approved March 2, 1901, and of Article 7 of the Appendix to the Constitution of the Republic of Cuba, promulgated on the 20th of May, 1902, which provide, quote, Article 7, to enable the United States to maintain the independence of Cuba independence and to protect the people thereof as well as for its own defense the Cuban de government will sell or lease to the United States the lands necessary for coaling or naval stations certain specific points to be agreed upon with the President of the United States 
have reached an agreement to that end as follows. Article 1. The Republic of Cuba hereby leases to the United States for the time required for the purposes of coaling and naval stations the following described areas of land and water situated in the island of Cuba. First, in Guantanamo, from a point on the southeast, 4.37 nautical miles to the eastward of Windward Point Lighthouse, a line running north through a distance of 4.25 nautical miles from the northern extremity of this line, a line running west through a distance of 5.87 nautical miles from the western extremity of this last line, a line running southwest through 3.31 nautical miles from the southwest extremity of this last line, a line running true south to the sea coast. This lease shall be subject to all the conditions named in Article 2 of this agreement. Second, in northwestern Cuba, in Bahia Honda, all that land included in the peninsula of Caro de Murillo and Punta del Carreno, situated in the westward of the line running south true from the north coast at a distance of 1,300 yards east true from the crest of Cerro del Rio and all of the adjacent waters touching upon the coastline of the above described peninsula and including the estuary south of Punta del Carreno with the control of the headwaters is necessary for sanitary and other purposes. In addition, all that piece of land and its adjacent waters on the western side of the entrance to Baja Honda, including between the shore and a line running north and south to low water marks through a point which is west, true distant one nautical mile from Plantation de Cayman. Of course, nautical miles, these little pirates are sailing on the high seas, entering into these contracts with each other to traffic human beings through treaties. The other one that you want to pay attention to is avalon.la.yale.edu 20th century VIP cubit. Whoopsie. Hold on one second. I'm repeating. There we go. avalon.la.yale.edu 20th century VIP cubit 00A 00 one treaty between the United States of America and Cuba, May 29, 1934, one year after the United States of America declared bankruptcy and went about collecting prisoners of war, according to the 1929 Geneva Convention. Signed at Washington, May 29, 1934, ratification advised by the Senate of the United States, May 31, 1934, Legislative Day of May 28, 1934, ratified by the President of the United States, June 5, 1934, ratified by Cuba, June 4, 1934, ratifications exchanged in Washington, June 9, 1934, proclaimed by the President of the United States, June 9, 1934 by the President of the United States of America a proclamation, whereas a treaty of relations between the United States of America and the Republic of Cuba was concluded and signed by their respective planet potentiaries at Washington on the 29th day of May 1934, the original of which treaty being in English and Spanish languages is word for word as follows. The United States of America and the Republic of Cuba being animated by the desire to fortify the relationships of friendships between the two countries and to modify with this purpose the relations established between them by this Treaty of Relations signed at Havana, May 22, 1903, have appointed with this intention as their plenipotentiaries, President of the United States of America, Mr. Cordell Hall, Secretary of State of the United States of America. And remember, folks, Secretary of State is clearing house, clearing the books for dis discharging congressional bankruptcy. And Mr. Sumner Wells, Assistant Secretary of State of the United States of America and the Provisional President of the Republic of Cuba, Senior Dr. Emmanuel Marquez Sterling, Ambassador Extraordinary and plenipotentiary 
of the Republic of Cuba to the United States of America. Now, this was an agreement between a former government and America. This is, these agreements have to happen after Congress facilitates war on another country and sets up the government for them. You can also read this in the book of Exodus. Who, after having communicated to each other their full powers, which are found to be in good and due form, have agreed upon the following articles. Article 1. Treaty of Relations, which was concluded between two contracting parties on May 22, 1903, shall cease to be in force and is abrogated from the date on which the present treaty goes into effect. Article 2. All of the acts affected by Q in Cuba by the United States of America during its military occupation of the island up to May 20th, 1902, the date on which the Republic of Cuba was established, have been ratified and held as valid. All rights legally acquired by virtue of these acts shall be maintained and protected. Congress is saying, well, guess we won the war. Time to set up shop in Cuba. Article 3. Until the two contracting parties agree to modification or abrogation of the stipulations of the agreement in regard to the lease to the United States of America, all lands in Cuba, for calling a naval station signed by the President of the Republic of Cuba on May, February 16, 1903, and the President of the United States of America on the 23rd day of the same month and year, the stipulations of that agreement with regard to the naval station of Guantanamo shall continue in effect. Supplementary agreement in regard to naval or air coaling stations signed between the two governments on July 20, July 2nd, 1903 shall continue in effect in the same form and on the same conditions with respect to the naval stations at Guantanamo, so long as the United States of America shall not abandon the said stable naval station of Guantanamo or the two governments shall not agree to a modification of its present term limits. The station shall continue to have the territorial area that is, it now has with the limits that it has on the date of the signature of the present treaty. Article 4. If at any time in the future a situation should arise that appears to point it to an outbreak of contagious disease in the territory of either of the contracting parties, either of the two governments shall, for its own protection, and without its act being considered unfriendly, exercise freely and at its discretion the right to suspend communications between those of its ports that it may designate and all or part of the territory of the other party and for the period that it may consider to be advisable. Article 5. The present treaty shall be ratified by the contracting parties in accordance with their respective constitutional methods shall so in effect on the date of this exchange of their ratifications which shall take place in the city of Washington as soon as possible in faith whereof the respective plenipotentiaries have signed the present treaty and have affixed their seals hereto. Done in duplicate in English and Spanish languages in Washington on the 29th day of May 1934 Cordell Holes, Sumner Wells, and Marquette Sterling and whereas the said treaty has been duly ratified on both both parts and the ratifications of the two governments were exchanged in the city of Washington on the 9th day of June 1934. Now, therefore, be it known that I, Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the United States, have caused the said treaty to be made public to the end that the same in every article and clause thereof to be observed and fulfilled with good faith by the United States of America and the citizens thereof. There's that little pledged asset we were looking for. In testimony whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused this seal of the United States of America to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington this ninth day of June in the year our Lord 1934 and the independence of the United States of America, the 158th Franklin D. Roosevelt, by the President, Cordial Hull, Secretary of State.
So, Fidel Castro accuses only John McCain and Israel of creating ISIS. These are interesting days. His country was taken over the same way. He's aligned with them through acts of Congress and treaties, pacts, peace treaties. Pact, it stems from PACS, P-A-X. For all of those new listeners that are unaware of those terms, in terms of it, quote, endearment, you can think of PACS as the kiss of death, that is Judas' kiss. It's how they traffic human beings to each other. Treaties are agreements between two banks. Well, we've seen this so many times before. You know, it's so sad to see again. Big story, AP.org, at USB base. South Korean ex-prostitutes face eviction. Pyongyang, South Korea. More than 70 aging women live in a squalid neighborhood between the rear gate of the U.S. Army garrison here and half a dozen seedy nightclubs. Near the front gate, glossy illustrations posted in real estate offices show the dream homes that may one day replace their one-room shacks. They once worked as prostitutes for American soldiers in this camp town near Camp Humphreys, and they've stayed because they have nowhere to go. Now the women are being forced out of the Anjong Ri neighborhood by developers and landlords eager to build on prime real estate around the soon to be expanded garrison. Quote, my landlord wants me to leave, but my legs hurt. I can't walk, and South Korean real estate is too expensive, says Chow, Cho Myung Ja, 75, a former prostitute who receives monthly court eviction notices at her home which she has rarely left after the last five years because of leg pain. Quote, I feel like I'm suffocating, she says. Plagued by disease, poverty, and stigma, the women have little to no support from the public or the government. Their fate contrasts greatly with a group of Korean women forced into sexual slavery by Japanese troops during World War II. Those so-called comfort women received government assistance under a special law and large crowds demanding that Japan compensate and apologize to the women attend weekly rallies outside of the Japanese embassy. While the camp town women get social welfare, there's no similar law for special or special funds to help them, according to Chu Peong take city officials who refuse to be named because of official rules. Many people in South Korea don't even know about the Camp Town women. In the decades following the devastation of the 1950 through 1953 Korean War, South Korea was a poor dictatorship deeply dependent on the U.S. military. Analytics say the South Korean government saw the women as necessary for the thousands, thousands of U.S. soldiers stationed in the South. Some of the women went to the camps voluntarily. Others were brought by pimps. In 1962, the government formalized the camp towns as, quote, special tourism districts with legalized prostitution. It means the government is cashing in on a portion of her value, by the way. That year, some 20,000 registered prostitutes worked in nearly 100 camp towns. Many, many more were unregistered. The women who became prostitutes saw few other options, but the work made them social pariahs. Unable to live or work anywhere else, says Park Kyung Su, Secretary General for the National Campaign for the Eradication of Crimes Against Korean Civilians, a group that tries to uncover and monitor alleged U.S. military crimes against South Koreans. 
Pockets of former Countdown women exist throughout South Korea. Now in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, the women of Anjong Ri mostly live alone in tiny homes, struggling to pay for food and rent on a monthly government stipend of 30,000 to 40,000 won, which is 300 or to 400 FRNs per month. Activists say most of the women are in danger of losing their homes. Quote, I'm so sorry that I can't help, says a Camptown woman who still only gave her surname Kim because she's ashamed of her past. The 75-year-old landlords have told her she has a month to leave and she looks nearly every day for a new home. Camptown woman's predicament began when Washington and Seoul agreed in 2004 to relocate the sprawling Yongsen U.S. base which takes up 620 acres of prime real estate in the center of wealthy Seoul to the basin Pyeongtaek, 70 kilometers from the capital. The deadline, originally set for 2012, is now tentatively 2016. At the end of the move, Camp Pomfries will have tripled in size and house more than 36,000 people, including troops, their family members, and civilian staff. Investors are eyeing the Pyeongtaek land in anticipation of homes for the U.S. military families and sites for businesses that will cater to the new flood of people with wealth. Piles of rubble from demolished homes sit next to new villas. A few blocks from some of the remaining shacks, a partially built apartment building rises to the beating of hammers and whirring of drills. Landlords eager to capitalize on rising land prices are trying to force the women out with pressure and eviction orders and they have more than quadrupled the monthly rent from $50,000 to $200,000 won, which is $200. FRN said Wu Soon Duke, director of the Sunlit Sister Center, a local non-government organization dedicated to the women. Hold on, they're being preyed on by the United States government, who has the agreement to develop, kick them out of there, after the U.S. government was the source of their plight. These females were forced, it says, into sex trafficking, laying down to U.S. incorporated soldiers, comfort women. And then instead of stopping the practice, they went on to tax these women. And now under fourth generation warfare, now that they're, they've aged out, they're no longer productive for the United States Incorporated and are being thrown away. Let's not sugarcoat anything. Now, this is absolutely not to be tolerated. This is a repeat of Bolshevik Russia. The very next step was of course what everybody saw as um, Nazi Germany. I'd like to touch on what happened back in the years of uh, nineteen fifty through nineteen fifty three Korea, the United States had infiltrated through of course the Central Intelligence Agency and its FBI agents perpetrating civil war on the ground in this country by which to take it over. Avalon.law.yale.edu 20th Century KOR 001 Mutual Defense Treaty between the United States and the Republic of Korea October 1st 1953 The parties to this treaty reaffirming their desire to live in peace with all peoples and governments and desiring to strengthen the fabric of peace in the Pacific area desiring to declare publicly and formally their common determination to defend themselves 
against external armed attacks so that no potential aggressor could be under the illusion that either of them stands alone in the Pacific area. Designed further to strengthen their efforts for collective defense, for the preservation of peace and security pending the development of a more comprehensive, with a grasping motion, comprehend an effective system of regional security in the Pacific area, have agreed as follows. Article 1. The partners, the parties, sorry, undertake to settle any international disputes in which they may be involved by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered and to retain their international relations with threat or use of force in any manner inconsistent, inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations or obligations assumed by any party toward the United Nations. Of course, that bank was established in 1945, United Nations Charter. Article 2, the parties will consult together whenever, in the opinion of either of them, the political independence or security of, the, of either of the parties is threatened by external armed attack. Separately and jointly, by self-help and mutual aid, the parties will maintain and develop appropriate, appropriate to take, appropriate, means to deter armed attack and will take suitable measures in consultation and agreement to implement this treaty and to further its purpose. Article 3. Each party recognizes that an armed attack in the Pacific area on either of the parties and territories now under the respective administrative control or hereafter recognized by one of the parties is lawfully brought under the administrative control of the other would be dangerous to its own peace and safety and declares that it would act to meet the common danger in accordance with its constitutional process. Article 4, the Republic of Korea grants and the United States of America accepts the right to dispose, dispose United States land, air, and sea forces in and about the territory of the Republic of Korea as determined by mutual agreement. Article 5. This treaty shall be ratified by the United States of America and the Republic of Korea in accordance with the respective constitutional processes and will come into force when instruments of ratification thereof have been exchanged by them at Washington. Article 6. This treaty shall remain in force indefinitely. Either party may terminate it one year after notice has been given to the other party. In witness whereof, the undersigned plenipotentiaries have signed this treaty, done in duplicate at Washington in the English and Korean language this day of this first day of October 1953. Understanding of the United States. The United States Senate gave its advice and consent to the ratification of the treaty subject to the following understanding. It is the understanding of the United States that neither party is obli obligated under Article 3 of the above treaty to come to aid of the other except in case of external armed attack against such party nor shall anything in the present treaty be construed as requiring the United States to give assistance to Korea except in the event of an armed attack against territory which has been recognized by the United States as lawfully brought under the administrative control of the Republic of Korea. The United States communicated the text of this understanding to the Republic of Korea in a note January 28, 1954 Acknowledged by the Republic of Korea in a note February 1st, 1954, the text of the understanding was included in the President's Proclamation, November 17, 1954. Ratifications were exchanged November 17, 1954. It's interesting what tangled webs one weaves. Just one moment, folks.
Whoops, sorry about that, folks. Um, missing phone and missing secretary. <laughs> it's funny. Um, there, there is just so much going on. Um, uh, it's absolutely unbelievable as these. Uh, folks with the forked tongues attempt to point the finger at each other when they all along have been in bed with each other and uh, I know that often these truths are, are painful to realize and experience however that is a requirement for your absolute freedom in all things if you don't know who your enemy is, you well, know, use your own common sense there. Uh, from WKYC.com, wanted salon doctor charged in illegal prescription case. Federal officials are seeking to capture a doctor accused of prescribing pain pillar killers without a medical purpose after he did not show up to his court arraignment. 59-year-old Dr. Syed Zaidi of Salon faces charges of distributing thousands of doses of Percocet, Oxycontin, and Opana without any legitimate medical purpose, according to a news release by the U.S. District Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. He was indicted on charges of health care fraud, conspiracy to distribute controlled substances, and money laundering. Zaidi worked at Pain Management of Northern Ohio and Salon. The indictment details he would not verify a patient's identity or a medical complaint and would also neglect to review patient's medical history or provide a diagnosis when he provided prescriptions. Zaidi also allegedly also continued to submit claims to Medicaid and Medicare or to private insurers and receive payments. Officials believe Dr. Zaidi fled to Pakistan. Interesting turn. Believe he fled. Course. Course. And he accidentally slipped onto the radar, flew out of the country, kind of like what happened on 9-11 and all of the hullabaloo after that because everybody's in cahoots with each other. Shh, come on, come on, you got a running start. Go, go somewhere where you can't be exercised easily. We'll make this really hard. It'll be a great presentation. Ready? One, two, three, ready, set, go! From Cleveland.com, Westlake Heart Doctor charged with performing unnecessary procedures over billing $7.2 million FRNs. Cleveland, Ohio, Westlake cardiologist whose offices were raided by the FBI in 2012 was charged today in a 16 count federal indictment with performing unnecessary unnecessary heart procedures and overbilling insurance companies by 7.2 million dollars FRNs. A grand jury returned an indictment charging Dr. Harry Persuad, 55, with health care fraud, 14 counts of making false statements, and money laundering. The indictment seeks a forfeiture of nearly $344,000 FRNs contained in two bank accounts in the names of Prasad and his wife Roberta. Prasad performed dozens of unnecessary stint insertions, catheterizations, and tests and caused, caused unnecessary coronary artery bypass surgeries to per be performed as part of a scheme to overbill Medicare and other insurers according to the indictment. At least 14 medical practice lawsuits have been filed against Prasad and Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court since 2012. Prasad pleaded guilt, not guilty to the charges during his initial appearance in U.S. District Court this afternoon. Magistrate Greg White ordered him to surrender his passport and avoid contact with any potential witnesses, then released him on a $25,000 personal bond. 
quote, he's a good physician and has done nothing wrong, end quote, said defense attorney Henry Hillow. U.S. Attorney Stephen Dattelbach called the case, quote, deeply troubling. Quote, inflating Medicare billings alone would be bad enough, Dietlbox said. Falsifying cardiac care records, making an unnecessary referral for open heart surgery, and performing needless and sometimes invasive heart tests and procedures is inconsistent with not only federal law, but a doctor's basic duty to his patients. Where is that written, Mr. Attorney, as the FDA and the Ethics Commission has always had contracts with each other to use human beings as human test subjects, and it is only now that this is coming to light. Ninety percent of the procedures and tests that are used upon human beings are, are uh, for that purpose. I'll continue reading. Stephen Anthony, a special agent in charge of the FBI's Cleveland office, said, quote, The doctor violated the sacred trust between doctor and patient by ordering unnecessary tests, procedures, and surgeries to line his pockets. Wait a second, Mr. Attorney! What happens when somebody is injured by these little faux pas? being brought into law says all the attorneys in that court of ball are going to cash in beyond your wildest wildest imagination to the tune of 33 billion dollars per estate guaranteed guaranteed in pooling and trust accounts two billion dollars each by such as their investors Johnson and Johnson, Dow Chemical Corporation, Monsanto, Aurora Medicine, and others that have investors such as Joseph Biden, Patrick Leahy, Diane Feinstein, Johnny Cornyn, Johnny Holdren, and others that get off and make loads of wads of those dollar bills on all those human test subjects fallen prey to what they believe is the United States of America a landmass when in reality it is only a chain of events and these events are exactly identical to this one it only depends on market conditions and who wants to play the fall guy Prasad was born in London and graduated in 1983 from St. Mary's Hospital Medical School at the University of London. He is board, board, board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, according to the American Board of Medical Specialties. Attorneys sit there, corporate counsel on these boards, catching in on all these human test subjects. Prasad had a private medical practice in Westlake with hospital privileges at St. John Medical Center Fairview Hospital in Cleveland and Southwest General Health Center in Middleburg Heights. Prasad devised a scheme to defraud Medicare. No, everything goes to the CMS system. I urge everybody to go right now to CMS.gov. Go to ICD-10. Everybody gets to play Job through the medical, psychological, and legal process. While Satan, which is usually dressed in an Armani suit, cashes in on their demise. Until now! Until now! Hey, look! Another fall guy. Again, I'm just irritated by all of these agents this week. It has been so absolutely profound. They're not only wailing and whining. I mean, it's like they're they're twitching and screaming in misery, and it's just been so 
it's irritating because now they want to whine and they want and then and then the the hi hey Tammy how you doing it's been a long time how are you I love you listen to your show all the time remember me about a year ago yeah okay how come you never want to talk to me how come you never reply to my post well I got tired of the agents for not replying to you. Uh, that way you know why there's a very important um yeah, wonder where it went. One of the most amazing things that I have witnessed thus far. Oh, that's a video. Um, the FBI has a wanted notice out for um, not custodial interference. The FBI has a warrant out for a mother who failed to return children to the father for his parenting time. She's been charged with kidnapping. Heads up! Mommy, dearest, it's time for your comeuppance. No more crap. Asylum seeker fa uh, death. Family calls for answers. This is on RT.com. I urge everybody to read that one because he died the same way that Joan Rivers just did, and so many others do when they become overhead and government wants to take it that overhead off of them. This week, it's been interesting watching corporations come in and try to pretend that they're human beings with errors. Um, U.S. State Department evidence is it is indoctrinating humanity through propaganda techniques by which to incite civil war. CNN State Department releases graphic anti-ISIS video. All of our listeners get a little chuckle out of that one as it has absolutely no evidence whatsoever but it has it's full of indoctrination so that you the sheeple can fear so that your government can come in and protect you and never let you know that it is ISIS. Now Money used to mean everything, and uh, there was a profound article on Politico.com this week, why John Edwards won and Bob McDonald lost. Why is Bob McDonald looking for a year, at years in federal prison while John Edwards is walking free? Federal government dragged both men into court on charges stemming from their role in public life. Edwards for alleged campaign finance violations relating to his mistress and McDonald for receiving gifts from a Virginia businessman. Both cases involving large sums of money and uncomfortable discussions of the politicians' private lives. And they contributed to the notion that politicians operate in a sphere, a sphere far removed from that of working Americans. Going into Edwards' trial, his reputation was in tattered over his highly publicized affair with videographer Rio Hunter. Edwards' life became fair for the national tabloids, which repeatedly noted that his dalliance took place as his wife Elizabeth was dry, dying of cancer. McDonald, by contrast, was a relatively well-liked and successful governor whose reputation took a hit late this, in his term as word emerged of the gifts he and his family received from star scientific CEO Johnny Williams Jr. Even as the details of the federal investigation spilled out late last year, McDonald retained the support of half of the Virginia voters. Juries in federal courthouses about 200 miles apart in sleepy mid-sized cities on the border south considered the evidence, but the results were widely different. McDonald was convicted of 11 felonies, while Edwards' tri jury acquitted him on one count and hung on the five others, prompting the feds to drop the case. Here's Politico's guide to six ways McDonald's defense went sour while Edwards succeeded. It all came down to the Rolex. 
McDonald was caught with his hand in the cookie jar up to his wrist. Unlike Edwards, McDonald was seen as personally profiting from the largess, largess of the political backer, while the money prosecutors argued was chipped in to aid the ex-senator never went to him directly. McDonald could not escape. Evidence like the photo showing him smiling while showing off the $6,500 watch. He claims that he didn't know Williams paid for it. Didn't seem to persuade the jurors. Pictures of him riding around in Williams' Ferrari didn't help his defense much either. Prosecutors argued that the value of the expenses involved in Edwards' case was about 900000 far higher than the 165000 McDonald and his family were accused of taking. But the two, the money two friends of Edward put out went to cover expenses incurred by Hunter to stay out, to stay at lavish hotels and travel by private jet. It was also paid out when Edwards was a presidential candidate, not a senator. Quote, I talked to multiple Edwards jurors who were telling me he never touched the money. Here you have the indisputable visual evidence of McDonald being on the receiving end of the benefits and Hampton Dellinger, a trial attorney who works in North Carolina and Washington, D.C. Quote, that doesn't necessarily end the legal inquiry for jurors visceral, but got reactions to the case. It could be a good distinction. One McDonald case juror said in a post-trial interview that it was clear the, McDonald, the gifts McDonald and his family took were directly linked to his public office. Kathleen Carmody told the Washington Post that jurors asked themselves, would the McDonald's have received these gifts if Bob McDonald's weren't the governor? Facts speak for themselves. It's interesting. We'll be back next week. Don't miss the Bone Rocco show right here. Revolution Radio Studio A. 10 to 12 Eastern Standard Time every Wednesday night. Be well, everybody.